Glory to Jesus Christ, you are listening to The Voice of Reason. Welcome to today's episode of Coffee with Reason. I hope that you guys have your special beverages. If you're drinking coffee or tea or soda or water or Hennessy, whatever it is that you like to drink at 10 in the morning, um, I hope that you are enjoying it. And thank you for joining me on today's episode. We are going to be going over that debate. I'm sure that a lot of you uh, saw it. Last Friday on Michael Lofton's Reason and Theology channel, I had a debate with a fellow Christian content creator named Benjamin. He goes by the name of Luigi on TikTok and Instagram, and we had a debate about the papacy. We debated papal supremacy in the first millennium. If you haven't watched it, guys, go and watch it. This debate was absolutely incredible. It was amazing. And on today's episode, I want to react to it. I want to review it. And I want to tell you guys what I thought of the debate and then kind of go over it. Now, my feelings on the debate, this is what I feel about the debate. When I was in there and I was debating him, I felt like it was like Marvin Hagler versus Tommy Hearns. You know what I'm saying? I felt like it was you know, Mayweather versus Maidana, you know what I'm saying? I thought that it was like, you know, when Canelo fought Golovkin the first time, that's how I felt. I thought that it was like, you know, uh, Wilder versus Fury, that's how it felt. It was like that. It was like one of those amazing, like, boxing matches where both guys are just beating the hell out of each other, just throwing blows. It was beautiful. It was glorious. It was legitimately, and I'm not being hyperbolic, I'm not just saying this to say it, I had the time of my life, I had a blast, because I love, I love debates, I love doing debates, and this was my first ever formal debate. Um, I've had tons and tons and tons of private debates in the past before I started doing this ministry, but this debate was my first uh, formal debate meaning that it was timed and we had, you know, to present pre-written statements and it was, uh, you know, all the bells and whistles and I loved it. It was amazing. So um, it was great. Since the debate has happened a few days ago now, I have had so many people reach out to me. First, I want to congratulate Luigi because so many people have reached out to me and they have told me that our debate is the best Catholic versus Orthodox debate about the papacy that they have ever heard, ever. And I had multiple people reach out to me and tell me that. And these aren't just people that have never seen a debate between Catholic and Orthodox. These were people that, one who explicitly told me and said, I've seen every single debate that there is on YouTube in English between Catholics and Orthodox. I've seen every single one of them. And he said that ours, that the debate that I had with, with Luigi, that it was the best he had ever seen which is crazy because it was my first formal debate. I think it was Luigi's first formal debate as well. I could be wrong, but I think it was his first formal debate too. And uh, that's amazing that we were able to put on the best debate uh, on the topic between a Catholic and an Orthodox ever. I think that's incredible, and I think that that is um, a huge accomplishment for the both of us, and in particular for Luigi. So many people told me also that Luigi himself, his performance was the best performance from an orthodox debater that they had ever seen. So many people told me that. What that means is that in his very first debate, in Luigi's first ever debate, he is already better than many other people that debate, you know, defending orthodoxy. Luigi, who is an orthodox inquirer, is already a better defender of orthodoxy than guys like Jay Dyer, you know, Craig Truglia, uh, even a lot of like priests like Father Josiah Trenum, Father, uh, you know, Peter Hears. In one debate, Luigi is already superior to all of them. He's already better than them. He's already, he is the guy now in, in Orthodox apologetics. Luigi, a guy who himself isn't even Orthodox yet. So I want to congratulate him because, uh, and this, is, this isn't me saying this. This is what a lot of other people have told me, that he was the best Orthodox debater that they had ever seen. And I have seen, I myself have seen a lot of debates between Catholics and Orthodox, and maybe I'm biased, but if I do say so myself, I do think that Luigi and I had the best debate that I've ever seen uh, between uh, Catholic and Orthodox on this particular uh, topic. Um, so, yeah, my hat's off to him. Um, and also, I know that a lot of people, a lot of Orthodox were upset 
that I was having a debate with Luigi and that it was on Michael Lofton's Reason and Theology show. A lot of people were, a lot of Orthodox were upset that it was a non-Orthodox and Orthodox inquirer who was defending Orthodoxy. Well, look, if you're Orthodox and you are upset that a non-Orthodox was in the debate, well, he did better than actual Orthodox debaters have ever done in English debates. He, in one debate, like I already said, he's already superior to the rest of them. So Orthodox shouldn't be mad just because Luigi isn't Orthodox yet. And also a lot of people were upset saying that I was picking on him or that maybe Michael Lofton was trying to pick on Orthodoxy by having a, a, a relatively new, unheard of person come onto his show for a full formal debate. Um, first of all, just to set the record straight, uh, Luigi was the one that actually reached out to me and he was the one that wanted to have the debate. He was actually supposed to debate somebody else and that person that he was supposed to debate pulled out. So uh, he reached out to me through a mutual fr a friend that we have, reached out to me and asked me to have the debate um, because he said that he had already put in something like 100 hours of study and the guy pulled out last minute so he was frustrated. So um, our friend Franco from Franco TV, he asked me if I could step in and do the debate and I said yes. So um, I, we had, I think, less, I think I had less than a month to prepare for it. We stepped in and we did it. And um, I asked Michael Lofton if he wanted to host it. He said, sure, no problem. Michael didn't pick him. He didn't put me against him. Michael didn't know who he was. I didn't know who Luigi was either. Luigi was the one that reached out to me and we just so happened to do it on Michael Lofton's show because he has the biggest platform and we want to have uh, a fight like this, uh, you know, a uh, you know, pound for pound, knock him out, drag him out brawl, like the type that we had. That's something um, that should be on the biggest stage. On, that's that's pay-per-view. That's Showtime, HBO Boxing, pay-per-view. I'm telling you, that is uh, a good fight right there. So it had to be done on the biggest stage. So we did it there. So um, if people are upset, remember, it was my first debate as well. Um, as a matter of fact, I think Luigi is more experienced in debates than me because from what I understand, Luigi has debates like on TikTok Live. Uh, he does debates with other Christians. So he probably is more experienced than I am. Um, and uh, yeah, and Michael Lofton, he only did it because I asked him to and he said, sure. Now, let's actually get down to business and let's talk about the debate. Now, this is my reaction to the debate, but obviously everyone who saw it, they had reactions to the debate. Um, so just to like summarize the reactions, just based on what I've heard, it seems to me like the majority of Catholics are no surprise. They were on my side and they thought that I came out on top of the debate. And then there were a lot of Orthodox that were on uh, Luigi's side and thought that he came out on the debate. Um, but then there's a lot of other Orthodox that were, for other reasons, upset that Luigi uh, was representing Orthodoxy in the debate for reasons that I'll get into here in a little bit as I get into, uh, into the debate itself. Actually, I'm going to give my opinion. I'm not going to talk about what do I think about did I win or did he win, you know, did I lose or did he lose. I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to give my opinion on that because I think that's corny, but what I am going to do is I am going to tell you how I messed up in this debate because I made a lot of mistakes. Maybe it's just because it was my first time debating, maybe it was just the jitters, maybe it was just, you know, I don't know. I made quite a few mistakes in the debate that I think cost me and if anybody judged me to have lost the debate, it's my fault because I made some straight amateur mistakes because I'm wet behind the ears um, but that's the reason that I'm doing this review is to call myself out so that I can uh, fix what I did wrong in the debate and also I want to engage with a lot of what Luigi actually said in the debate because he made some points that uh, during the debate seemed like they were good points but as I've gone back and I've actually done my research and my homework about the points that he brought up well I just want to talk about what he brought up because I think that if you look deeper into uh, the points that he made, I think that you might come away with a different conclusion. So um, let's begin. So in my opening statement in the debate, so the, the, the debate was about the papacy was, was the Pope supreme in the first millennium according to the Vatican I definition of papal supremacy. That was what we were debating. <clears throat> so I had the affirmative of the debate and uh, so it was simple. All I had to do was uh, prove that papal supremacy, according to Vatican I, did exist in the first millennium. So in my opening statement, I brought up how there were uh, at least one dozen unique ways in which the popes of the first millennium 
exercise papal supremacy. I'm going to summarize those ways right here really quick in, the, in, in this video, just so that all of you guys who maybe haven't seen the debate yet um, can know exactly what it was that I demonstrated in my opening statement. I demonstrated that uh, there were uh, instances in the first millennium that included the popes be, uh, binding the entire Christian church to doctrinal pronouncements, uh, including definitively condemning heresies, uh, settling matters of discipline in other territories outside of the West, convoking regional and provincial synods in the East, uh, reversing the decrees of Eastern bishops and entire regional councils, uh, having the sole authority of ratifying councils on the universal level and making them ecumenical or making them binding for the church, uh, refusing to ratify other councils, uh, even ones that Roman emperors convoked and that other bishops and even patriarchs participated in uh, making them null and void. Uh, also picking and choosing which individual canons were authoritative and making them universally binding, uh, rejecting other individual canons, making them null and void for the universal church, uh, excommunicating Eastern clerics and even entire Eastern regions from universal communion, and the excommunications being accepted by the rest of the church without protest, uh, removing Eastern deacons, presbyters, and bishops from their positions and replacing them with new ones, either of his own choosing or by his personal acceptance, setting doctrinal and disciplinary conditions for the readmittance of schismatics back into full communion with the universal church, and finally, being the ultimate definitive authoritative and universal court of appeals whose final decisions no other bishop or synod of bishops could appeal. So those are 12 different ways, uh, 12 unique ways that in the first millennium, the popes uh, exercise the universal uh, authority, their universal jurisdiction. And then for the rest of the uh, opening statement, I just go on starting from the first century, going all the way to the eighth century. I just list all of these different examples in history. Um, I don't even, I didn't tally up how many examples I gave, but there was a bunch in the first millennium. So I gave my opening statement and I'm, I'm going to judge the debate just based on like section you know, section by section, my opening statement, his opening statement, my, you know, rebuttal, my cross-exam, my closing statement, all that. Um, the way that I feel about my opening statement is that <clears throat> I think that when you compare both of the opening statements, my opening statement and his opening statement, I think that my opening statement was stronger on paper. However, I think that the way that I delivered it I think that he delivered his opening statement better than I delivered mine because um, as I was doing it, as I was reading my opening statement, I thought that maybe I was just, I packed too many examples in it and I had too much in it that maybe I could imagine that for like a viewer, it would be hard for them to maybe like follow along because it's just so much information. I'm just shooting so many bullets at you that it's kind of hard to digest and also and this is, again, just part of being an amateur, part of it being my first time. I couldn't stick to my time, which is right away, strike one for me, terrible, that I, I couldn't fit, I couldn't stick within the 25-minute time limit. My opening statement was too long. But so when the timer ran out on me and Michael Lofton said, cut, that's it, you're done, uh, Luigi, he was actually nice enough. He was a gentleman, and he allowed me to actually he gave me a couple of more minutes to keep reading the opening statement before he gave his. So I looked really bad uh, in that respect that my opening statement wasn't within the 25 minute uh, uh, allotted time that we, gave, that we gave ourselves. And then just the fact that the way that I delivered it, I don't know if I delivered it in a way that would be persuasive to the audience that was uh, watching the debate. And uh, Luigi, when he gave his opening statement, he delivered it perfectly. He delivered it like somebody who's been debating for years. Uh, he, he, was, he was good. He, he, his opening statement in, in delivery was excellent. Um, so I think that my opening statement was superior in, in the actual content just on paper, but I think that his probably came off better just because, first of all, he was able to stay within the time limit. He finished with a minute to spare. He brought up really good points and he was able to take his time. He talked slowly. He probably uh, was able to, I think that his statement was easier to follow along as he was uh, uh, reading it. My statement, because it had so much packed into it, it probably was very difficult to follow along because I was kind of 
speeding through it because I knew that the clock was against me and I wanted to fit it all in, which I failed to do. So that's that. That's the opening statement, right? So maybe if mine was better on paper, but he delivered his better, maybe that means that it was a draw. Our opening statements were a draw. I don't know if you judge it in that way. But then when we move on to the, uh, to the rebuttal period, then actually when he was giving his opening statement, I made another huge mistake. Uh, again, maybe just because it was my first time and I was jittery. Um, so while he was giving his opening statement, I was like jotting down notes. I was like writing down all of the points that he was making um, so that I could respond to each point that he was making one by one uh, after he was done with his opening statement, right? Well, I don't know if you guys will be able to see here, but this is, this right here, this is the paper in which I wrote like my notes. I was like writing down his, his, his points the points that he gave in his opening statement. I don't know if you can tell, but um, I can't read this. I don't know what this says. I can't read it because I was writing so fast because I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss anything. I didn't miss any of the points that he made in his opening statement that I was writing so fast that when, by the time he was finishing up his opening statement and I went back to look at what I wrote down, I couldn't read what I wrote down on the paper, like it, it's illegible. I don't know if you can tell, but I can't, I can't read this. It is illegible on both sides. So I messed up really bad because, um, yeah, when I looked back at it, I didn't know what to respond to because I couldn't read what I wrote. So I kind of had to go backwards just based on memory. Um, and I started with the last thing that he said, and then I uh, kind of just responded to as much as I could remember. And because I made this mistake, this amateur mistake, I panicked. So I think that my rebuttal, I don't think it was very good at all. I think that I failed in the rebuttal period, and I think that his rebuttal was superior to my rebuttal. Um, but, however, um, I've gone back uh, since, and I've rewatched it again a couple of times, and um, I was able to actually, I was able to actually write everything down neatly. So all of the points that he made, uh, you know, I was able to rewatch the debate, you know, rewatch it. And I was able to write everything down neatly. So I have all of the points that he made right here on this nice, neat sheet of paper. If only I could have done that during the bait, I think uh, my rebuttal period would have gone a lot better. Instead, it was not that good because I made the amateur mistake. But I actually wanted to uh, go through the points that he made in his opening statement. And I wanted to respond to, I want to respond to all of the points that he made. So the first point that he made in his, um, opening statement is that he said that I had to prove that the Pope was infallible. Now, from the very beginning, this is, a, this is a problem that we ran into, and I hope that he doesn't mind me saying this, but right before we went live on YouTube, um, we were just, you know, getting all the backstage stuff ready. We were, you, he and I were both talking to Michael Lofton. We went over, again, the, uh, the resolution of the debate, and he mentioned, uh, before we even went live, he mentioned that he was going to be touching on... Uh, on papal infallibility, because Michael Lofton, he read the Vatican I definition of papal supremacy, and he said, this is what I'm going to read, and then you guys are going to be responding to this, and um, Luigi said, can you also read the part about infallibility, and that was when it, it got kind of a little awkward, because um, the, uh, the debate was about papal supremacy, it was about the pape having immediate and universal jurisdiction, it wasn't about papal infallibility, those are two different two distinct issues, and, and uh, Michael said, it's like, well, th this debate isn't about infallibility, and Luigi said, well, uh, I kind of prepared also, you know, he prepared his presentation also taking infallibility into account, and um, so finally, uh, you know, Michael left it up to me, and he said, it's up to you, Alex, if you want to uh, allow for it, you know, it's up to you, and I felt bad, I, because I, he prepared for it, I didn't want to say, no, you're not allowed to present you know, a big chunk of your, uh, of what you prepared for, I felt bad, so I said, you know what, that's fine, we can talk about infallibility too, even though that wasn't, uh, that wasn't part of the resolution of the debate, so, so we allowed it, and that was the first point that he made in his opening statement, he, uh, he brought up the infallible Pope, what I could have said in the rebuttal, I could have brought up the infallible Pope and said, you know, that's a matter of infall that's a matter of papal infallibility, that's not a matter of papal supremacy, so that isn't really, uh, relevant to the debate, um, but again, I allowed it, so I, I feel like I had to respond to it, um, 
throughout the debate, and I think that in my opening statement, I presented uh, cases of papal infallibility as well anyway, because it is so closely tied to papal supremacy. Um, he brought up Apostolic Canon 34, and uh, he, and this is going to tie in much later, later on in the debate, this is going to tie in, but he brought up Apostolic Canon 34, and he even quoted it, and I'm not going to respond to it now because it came up again later in the debate, and this is one of the most important parts of the debate, so I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. But after Apostolic Canon 34, he brought up that Rome cannot act without the Council of the Church. So to respond to that, you know, in my opening statement, I brought up again multiple times, you know, multiple examples of popes acting without the Council of uh, the Church. Uh, for example, the back-to-back -back popes, uh, Pope Theodore and Pope Martin, they both exercised universal jurisdiction uh, by their own power, um, without um, asking for the consent of the church. That's just, those are just two examples of back-to-back -back popes. There are multiple examples in my opening statement that I presented uh, Rome acting without the consent of the church. Um, he also talked about, and he also said that that was the burden of proof that I had that I had to show it, and I uh, met the burden of proof in my opening statement. He also brought up Canon 9 of Antioch. I can actually just talk about Canon 34, uh, of the Apostolic Canon 34 and can Canon 9 of Antioch. Apostolic Canon 34 is about uh, patriarchal jurisdiction, and Canon uh, 9 of Antioch is about metropolitan jurisdiction. So Canon 34, Apostolic Canon 34, and Canon 9 of Antioch actually don't apply to the Pope as a universal, uh, as a universal head of the church because those canons aren't about the universal head of the church, those canons are about a patriarch and a metropolitan. So um, something that I wish that I had brought up in the debate, uh, if I had been able to actually respond, because uh, I was going backwards in my rebuttal period, um, if I had been able to respond, and again, this does come up later on in the, in the cross-examination, um, what I wish that I would have said is that um, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, functions in multiple ways. So the Pope, functions as a universal head of the church, but that's only one of his functions. The Pope also functions as the patriarch of the West, as the patriarch uh, of Italy. The Pope also functions as a metropolitan. Back when uh, Rome, before Rome was its own city-state, before the Holy See was its own city-state, the Pope was the Archbishop of Rome. He was the metropolitan. He was the metropolitan bishop of all of Italy. And then the Pope also functions as just a local bishop. The Pope also functions as the Bishop of Rome. So the Pope functions as a local bishop. He also functioned as a provincial metropolitan, and he also uh, functioned as a regional patriarch. So those are all of his functions uh, before the function of universal head of the church. These canons, Canon 34 and Canon 9, only apply to those lower functions of the Pope, not to his function as the uh, universal head. He also brought up the Council of Sardica, which was an Eastern Synod that took place in the year 343, which was convoked by a Pope. So that alone, the fact that the Pope was able to convoke an Eastern Synod, that's actually one of my points that I made, that he had the authority to do that, uh, to convoke uh, synods in Eastern territories. And he tried to argue that Sardica limits the power of the Pope. And I've always found this really interesting because there are many Eastern Orthodox that I think that they appreciate the weight that the Council of Sardica has in favor of the papacy. So they tried to interpret it in a way that tries to, I think, diminish the, the power that the papacy has. The Council of Sardica, what that synod uh, teaches is that Rome is the where the buck stops, that Rome is the final court of appeals. And canons uh, 4 and 7, which I quoted later on uh, during the um, cross-examination period, canons 4 and 7 explicitly say that um, when uh, a cleric, a presbyter or a bishop appeals to Rome, whatever is going on in the East has to stop until the Bishop of Rome comes to a conclusion and makes a final decision. And when that decision is made by the church in Rome, by the Pope, that decision is definitive and it cannot be overturned or even appealed by any other bishop or synod of bishops. The, uh, that's in Canons 4 and uh, 7. And what he tried to do was uh, he brought up canons 3, 4, 5, and 9, and uh, he was trying to argue that those canons teach that the Pope was limited, that he could only send legates to the East to hear a, a case, that he could only send legates as if the Pope himself couldn't go to the East and hear uh, 
the case by himself, which he could have. It just isn't very practical for the Bishop of Rome to leave uh, Rome to go all the way to the east, which back in those times took a really long time to travel from the west to the eastern part of the Roman Empire just to hear uh, a case or maybe a couple of cases of, uh, you know, of presbyters or deacons uh, who are appealing above their bishops and even above their synods to Rome. There's nothing in the Council of Sardica that says that the Pope can only do this, which is send legates. The Council of Sardica is actually very clear that uh, the Pope has the ultimate, he has the final say. He has the final say, meaning that it can't be overruled, uh, it can't even be appealed. So the Council of Sardica doesn't help the Eastern Orthodox. So I always find it interesting because he's not the first Orthodox to try and make Sardica sound like it's on their side. Um, if you actually go back and just read it yourself and you read the canons, it's clear that Sardica is on the side of the Catholic Church. Um, and again, that comes up later on in the debate. But he also mentioned that uh, the seven councils were not called by the Pope and how Vatican once says that it's the prerogative of the Pope, of the Bishop of Rome, to you know, call, convoke, and even preside over ecumenical councils. Well, that's an easy one. Just because it's the prerogative of a Pope to do it, doesn't mean that he always has to be the one to do it. Vatican I says that it's the prerogative for the Pope to even preside over councils, but even, in, you know, even after the schism, most of the councils that have taken place after the schism, the Pope didn't preside over them. He called them, but he didn't preside over them. Um, so just because Vatican I says that it's his prerogative doesn't mean that he has to do it each and every single time that an ecumenical council uh, is called. So that point, uh, that doesn't prove anything. And, and that actually leads to the next point that he made, which was that uh, the original Synod of Lateran in 649 was not successfully made ecumenical. And this is because in the first millennium, during the time of the Roman Empire, even up into the, into the uh, first 400 years of the second millennium, um, ecumenical has a very specific meaning. And ecumenical means that it is uh, not only for the church, but that it is imperial. Ecumenical is actually a civil term. So an ecumenical council means that it is uh, received uh, imperially, meaning that the civil courts receive it as well. So if Lateran 649 um, isn't ecumenical, it's because uh, the emperor didn't want to uh, recognize it as ecumenical. However, the teachings of Lateran 649 were still universally binding on the church um, because uh, the Council of Constantinople III, for example, says that the teachings of Lateran 649 already definitively decided what the Council of Constantinople III uh, was able to ratify also in an ecumenical council. So um, the point of Lateran 649 and its importance isn't that it wasn't ecumenical. It wasn't ecumenical because the emperor uh, wouldn't accept it uh, imperially. Um, what it taught still applied to the church. So that's actually the more important point. And then he, you know, going off of that, he said that monothelitism wasn't anathematized until Constantinople III. But I pointed out, I actually had pointed out in my opening statement that Pope Agatho, who was the Pope uh, during the Council of Constantinople III, he himself says at the Council in one of his writings that uh, what the Council had decreed had already been definitively uh, decreed by his predecessor, Pope Martin I, who is the one who called uh, the Synod of Lateran 649. So uh, again, it, it actually, his point that, mono, that monothelitism wasn't condemned until Constantinople III, it's just not true according to Constantinople III. And he also mentioned that like most Catholic arguments involve a council. Uh, this point I don't really understand because I, again, I find it really ironic that um, the Catholic Church is the church that has been able to continue to have ecumenical councils and the Eastern Orthodox Church has not been able to hold ecumenical councils since the schism. So even if arguments uh, involve a council, it actually doesn't hurt uh, our position. It doesn't make our position less credible. As a matter of fact, it should actually make our position more credible to the Orthodox because for the Orthodox, the ecumenical councils are the highest authority. So if the ecumenical councils teach the papacy, which they do, then that's the point, that according to the Orthodox's own highest authority, they have to accept the Catholic understanding of the papacy because the ecumenical councils teach it. He said that Constantinople III in session 8 calls Pope Agatho's teachings merely suggestions. 
So he said that they were only suggestions. They weren't binding. They weren't authoritative. That's the point that he was trying to make. This is a really bad argument because, um, so the word suggestions that you read in Constantinople 3, um, remember that Constantinople 3 is a, in English, when you read it in English, it is a translation of something that was written in Greek. What he was referring to here in Constantinople 3, calling Pope Agatho's teachings as uh, suggestions, that's actually coming from an old translation from 1901, uh, an English translation. Back in the day, back in 1901, the word suggestion didn't have the same meaning and connotation as it does now. In today's uh, day, when you say the word suggestion, we think of a suggestion as something that's on the table and you can take it or you can leave it. It's not necessary. <clears throat> but that's not what the word meant back then in 1901 when Constantinople III was translated into English. Even if you just like look up suggestion in the dictionary, um, there are two definitions, the current definition and like the old English definition. The first definition of suggestion is the action of suggesting something, which doesn't really say much. But if you look at the old uh, definition, it is um, something that implies or indicates a certain fact or situation. So for the modern uh, uh, definition of suggestion, uh, <clears throat> the sentence that is used as an example says this, at my suggestion, the museum held an exhibition of his work. And the old English uh, definition says this, there is no suggestion that he was involved in any wrongdoing. So um, he is uh, anachronistically applying the current uh, definition of that word to something uh, from 1901 that that word didn't have that definition back then. And also, here's the bigger point. That same Greek word that is translated as suggestion in 1901, that same green, Greek word is also applied to imperial decrees. So imperial decrees that the Roman emperor would make back in the first millennium, they were called suggestions. It was the same Greek word that is translated as suggestions. So if he wants to say that Pope Agatho's teachings were only suggestions, it's not, the word, it's not the word that he thinks it is. It's a different word, and it's the same word that was used for imperial decrees. And would you say that imperial decrees in the first millennium were something that you could just, they were on the table that you could take it or leave it? No, imperial decrees were authoritative, but they were suggestions. So that point doesn't work either. He said that Constantinople III applies Matthew 16 not to the Pope, but to the Emperor. And he quoted the council uh, that calls, and I think it was Pope Agatho, it was a Pope Agatho quote, that called the Pope inviolable. So he quoted that saying that the Emperor at this council is called inviolable, and because it's Matthew 16 that's being applied to the emperor, that that means that he's infallible. Here's the problem with that. The word inviolable doesn't mean infallible. That's not what it means. He is assuming that that word means infallible, and it doesn't. Inviolable means that it cannot be dishonored um, or infringed upon. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that it is uh, infallible, that it cannot err. It seemed like in the debate, and, and this I found really interesting, in trying to disprove the Catholic position, it seemed like he was really trying to prove Cicero papism, which is something that the Orthodox obviously don't hold to and something that doesn't exist. Cicero papism, uh, what that means is just that the Roman emperor is the head of the church and that the Roman emperor, he calls the shots, he's the one that decides everything. It seemed like throughout the debate, that's what he was trying to prove in order to undermine the Catholic position. But him trying to prove Cicero papism for obvious reasons, doesn't work because we have no Roman emperor. So he's trying to prove something that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, if, if Cicero papism is true and Catholicism is wrong, I have nothing to convert to because we don't have a Roman emperor who is the head of the church anymore. Um, if that is true, even though that's not true, and I demonstrate that Cicero papism isn't, isn't correct, but um, he says that because the council applies Matthew 16 to the, to the emperor, that means that the emperor is infallible, and he is justifying that position because the uh, emperor is called inviolable, even though the word inviolable does not mean infallible. So his next point after that was also about how Constantinople III condemned Pope Honorius, right? So he says, and I actually addressed this in my opening statement as well, I 
talked about it preemptively before he could even make that argument. So you can just go back to my opening statement where um, Constantinople III, uh, that council declared Pope Honorius to have uh, been a private heretic, but that same council of Constantinople III, which he actually brought up later um, in the uh, audience Q&A, that same council of Constantinople III, that same council that, uh, that um, calls Pope Honorius a heretic, that council teaches papal infallibility. Just a couple of sessions before Honorius was condemned as a heretic, uh, the council teaches that uh, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, uh, is uh, infallible and has always been infallible, that all of uh, Pope Agatho's predecessors were infallible. That includes Pope Honorius. It says that all future popes would be as well. So Constantinople III teaches papal infallibility, and at the same time, it condemns a pope for being a heretic. Now, some people might see that as a contradiction, but it isn't, because the Catholic teaching is that the Pope can never teach heresy. The Pope cannot teach heresy in his magisterium. That doesn't mean that the Pope himself can't personally be a private heretic. And Pope Honorius was condemned as being a personal private heretic. He was not condemned for ever teaching heresy as the Pope. And this actually comes up later on, so I have more to say about that because it does come up later on. And here's another thing that we need to take into account too, and I said this also in the debate, the only reason that Constantinople III is authoritative is because it was ratified by Pope Agatho. So Constantinople III um, condemned a pope, but the only reason Constantinople III uh, is uh, authoritative is because a pope, Pope Agatho, affirmed it, he ratified it, and he did so, when Pope Agatha ratified Constantinople III, he did so by the power of his Petrine authority. So that would be kind of awkward for Pope Agatha to invoke his Petrine authority to ratify a council when that council had already found a pope uh, guilty of heresy. That would be kind of a contradiction, but the reason it's not a contradiction is because, again, Pope uh, uh, Honorius wasn't judged as teaching heresy, only as uh, holding a heresy privately, which actually is not even true. It's not accurate. Pope Honorius wasn't a heretic uh, anyway. So anyway, moving on though, the next point that he made was, um, so he's actually going backwards in time, now, uh, in time now because the next thing he said was Constantinople II. And I, again, I addressed this also in my opening statement before he got to say anything about it. I addressed Constantinople II, and that was the issue with Pope Vigilius, the Roman Emperor Justinian, where the Roman Emperor wanted to condemn the three chapters. The three chapters were uh, three writings that were written by three different bishops at the previous Ecumenical Council of uh, Chalcedon, and these writings were clearly heretical writings. They were uh, Nestorian. So what happened was that Pope Vigilius, he wrote a document called the Judicatum, uh, which condemned the three chapters as being uh, heretical. So he did this, and he actually did this apart from the council. And when he did this, when he wrote the Judicatum, that was enough for the emperor. The emperor was like, okay, we don't need to call the council now because the pope, who is the head of the church, the infallible head, he has already condemned uh, the three chapters. And the reason that the emperor wanted the three chapters to be condemned was because he was trying to heal the Oriental Orthodox schism. Because at the Council of Chalcedon, the uh, Christians of Alexandria, they broke away from the rest of the church because they thought that the Council of Chalcedon uh, was teaching Nestorianism when it read the three chapters out in the Acts of the Council. So Pope Honorius, by himself, without the use of a council, he himself condemned the three chapters with the Judicatum. And the emperor accepted it and even said, okay, we don't need to have a council now because the pope has taken care of this. The only problem is that uh, that Judicatum that Pope Vigilius wrote, it caused a schism um, in the West. It's caused a schism in Italy that lasted for, I want to say something like 30 years. So the pope, because he didn't want another schism, he pulled the Judicatum. He pulled it and he said, okay, never mind, I'm not going to put this out because even though I am defending the Orthodox faith, it's confusing uh, uh, some of the faithful and they're breaking away because they think that the Catholic Church has just invalidated itself. They think that uh, if I come out and I uh, condemn something that an ecumenical council did in its acts, they think that that uh, is disproving uh, uh, the uh, Catholic Church, um, that the Catholic Church is going back on something that it taught before and that it has just uh, falsified itself, so that's why it caused uh, the schism, right? And that's the, a wrong understanding 
But Pope Vigilius, who was being pastoral, he was thinking with the pastoral mind, um, he pulled the judicatum because he didn't want to cause that schism, obviously, right? Well, when he pulled the judicatum and he said, no, never mind, that was when uh, the Emperor Justinian, uh, he called Constantinople too, because he said, well, I know that Pope Vigilius agrees with me that the three chapters need to be condemned. I'm the Roman Emperor. I'll call the council. I'll condemn the three chapters. Pope Vigilius will ratify it because I already know he agrees with me. And because I'm the Roman Emperor, everyone in the empire has to listen to me whether they like it or not. So uh, Pope Vigilius thought that he was going to be able to fix the schism with Constantinople II, and he was wrong. The Oriental Orthodox didn't come back into communion with the church at Constantinople II. But um, what had happened was that um, when he said that he was going to hold uh, the council, um, uh, the Emperor Justinian, Pope Vigilius said, no, I'm not going to go along with that. Because when I wrote the Judicatum, that caused a schism here in Italy. Imagine if you call an ecumenical council, what do you think that's going to do? You're going to cause another schism. So no, I don't want there to be an ecumenical council. That's going to cause more problems than fix the problems that we already have. There has to be another way. So this is what Pope Vigilius thought of. He said, I know what I can do. I can write a second document. Um, this document, uh, the second document he wrote was called the First Constitutum. And in this document, I can uphold the Orthodox faith and I can just interpret the three chapters to be Orthodox. So he wrote that second document and he said, I'm going to interpret um, uh, the writings of these three heretics and I'm going to say that they were upholding the Orthodox faith. And then that's how it's going to keep everybody happy. No one is going to be confused. We won't have any more schisms. So that's what he did. That's what Pope Vigilius did. Now, he did this. He did this, but the problem is that the Roman Emperor, uh, he had already, um, Constantinople II had already been underway. And Constantinople II had already condemned the three chapters and had publicly said that Pope Vigilius had already condemned the three chapters in his, uh, um, in his first document in the Judicatum. So he kind of threw Pope Vigilius under the bus saying, hey, Pope Vigilius considers the three chapters to be heretical, even though Pope Vigilius was trying to uphold orthodoxy by interpreting uh, these heretical documents in an orthodox way. And the emperor kind of ruined that. So, um, and Pope Vigilius was under house arrest at this time, by the way. Pope, um, the emperor uh, kidnapped Pope Vigilius from Rome, brought him back to Constantinople to try and force him or convince him to ratify the council. Now, if the Pope isn't above councils, and I say this in my opening statement, if the Pope isn't above councils, that's a whole lot of work for the Emperor to have to go and kidnap the Pope from Rome, take him all the way to Constantinople. If the Pope isn't, uh, if the pope isn't above councils, um, or if all of the other patriarchs are equal, because as I mentioned in my opening statement, the patriarchs of Alexandria uh, and Antioch were actually put in those positions by the Roman Emperor himself. So uh, he, could have had, he could have had Alexandria ratify the council. He didn't. He could have had Antioch ratify the council. He didn't. He could have even had the uh, patriarch of his own city, the patriarch of Constantinople, ratify the council. He was right there in his own city, and he didn't. He went out of his way to kidnap the pope to bring him back to Constantinople because the Roman emperor knew that only the pope could ratify the council. So after being under house arrest for nine years, Pope Vigilius finally ratifies the council. When he ratified the council, though, he didn't just say, fine, this council is, is, ecu is ecumenical, it's binding on, on, on the faithful, there you go, you win. He actually wrote a third document, the Second Constitutum. In the Second Constitutum, uh, in the second constitutum he uh, condemned the three chapters as heretical, he upheld the Orthodox faith, and he ratified the council, but he didn't even mention the council by name. And um, the way that Luigi was presenting this uh, fact of history, uh, the way that Luigi was presenting this part of history, he was presenting it uh, as if uh, the Pope was submitting to the council. That's not true. Go back and read the Third Constitutum. He doesn't mention the council by name. He condemns the three chapters by his own authority. And then he says that the council agrees with him and that he is ratifying it to make it ecumenical. So it's not true that Constantinople II saw itself over a Pope. It's the exact opposite. Uh, the emperor knew that he needed the Pope for Constantinople II to be ratifying and binding. And Luigi brought up a lot of what Constantinople II says. He brought up, he quoted a lot of the acts. It's important to understand that if, Constant, if, if what Luigi was arguing is true about Constantinople II, that Constantinople II really was over the Pope, that doesn't prove Eastern Orthodoxy. Again, that proves Caesarol Papism. 
because the Roman emperor, a lay person, he wasn't a bishop, right? He was just the Roman emperor. He was calling all of the shots and he was telling uh, the patriarchs and all of the bishops there what was going to happen. He said, this is what we're going to do. You have no say in it. It was a complete um, Cicero-Papist council. And the only reason it's authoritative is because Pope Vigilius um, ratified it. If Pope Vigilius had never ratified it, I promise you, Constantinople II would not be considered an ecumenical council by the universal church. But because he did, it is. But when you go and you read the history of, of, of uh, the historical context and what was happening um, around Constantinople II, it proves the papacy. It proves that the pope is above ecumenical councils. And again, I made that point in my uh, opening statement, um, but not in so many words. So I was able to give a much more thorough uh, description of history here. He actually contradicted himself too in his, in his uh, opening statement because he uh, quoted uh, the council saying that the apostles didn't need the counsel of each other in their work. If the apostles didn't need the counsel of each other of their work, what that means is that counsels are not necessary. So he's trying to prove the conciliar model, but he unknowingly contradicted himself by quoting something from the council that said that the apostles didn't need counsels, that the apostles were able to work apart from the counsel of one another. So he actually contradicted himself there unknowingly. Uh, the next point that he made was, uh, he asked a question, he said, which of Pope Vigilius's constitutums uh, was infallible. Now, what I should have responded, I could have said, well, that's a matter of papal infallibility, not a matter of papal supremacy, so um, that isn't relevant to this debate. But because I allowed uh, papal infallibility to be, to be brought into the debate, um, my response was, which I said later on in the cross-examination, was that both of them were infallible because in both of them, he was upholding the Orthodox faith. And this is something that it, it seemed like it really confused him he, he couldn't understand how the two constitutums that contradict each other on the matters of the orthodoxy of the three chapters um, could be teaching the same thing. So I explained to him in the debate that the Pope and ecumenical councils for that matter are infallible only in matters of faith and morals, only in matters of what is in the deposit of faith of what Jesus Christ revealed to the apostles. The church whether it's the Pope by himself or the universal church together in a council, they are only infallible in those matters. All, they're only infallible in matters of fact about the deposit of faith. They're not infallible in other matters of fact uh, that are separate from the deposit of faith. And uh, the point that I was trying to make was that the three chapters, there is nothing in divine revelation, there is nothing in the deposit of faith that was given by Christ to the church once and for all to the apostles, by the apostles. There is nothing in that deposit of faith that says that the three chapters that were read at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 are heretical or orthodox. There's nothing there that says that. So whether the church calls something heretical or whether the church calls something uh, orthodox, it could be wrong in doing so, but uh, no matter what way it goes, it would be upholding the true orthodox faith that the Holy Spirit um, guides the church into. Um, so I know that concept was, I could tell in the debate that it was new for him, um, but it's a really important concept that uh, even a lot of Catholics aren't aware of, so I can understand why he wouldn't be aware of it, but it's really important, and that is the answer to his question. And then the next point that he made was, uh, he brought up Matthew 18, in which uh, the keys that were given to Peter in Matthew 16 were also given to the rest of the apostles in Matthew 18, and then he, he uh, presents a false dichotomy. He presents the, uh, the false dichotomy of the church versus the Pope. The Catholic position isn't the church versus the Pope, it's the church will always be in line with the Pope. It's, it's both and, not either or. So that was a false dichotomy, so that point doesn't work either. And again, the best way to uh, demonstrate that the Catholic position is the accurate position in that particular matter is that the Catholic Church still has councils. The Eastern Orthodox Church has not had a single council, a single ecumenical council, um, or a single universal council since the schism. So that fact alone proves the Catholic position um, in that, that false dichotomy that he set up, it just doesn't work. Um, and then the next point he made was about um, St. Ignatius. He brought up St. Ignatius and he said that according to St. Ignatius, if you have the Eucharist, uh, you have everything, right? I don't think he realizes how that point actually undermines what he's trying to prove. 
he is saying that if you have the Eucharist, you have everything, right? Well, Catholics have the Eucharist. So according to what he said, and this is Luigi's quote, that must mean that Catholics have everything, right? Now, there are a lot of Orthodox that will say, no, Catholics don't have the Eucharist. But then there are other Orthodox that say, actually, yeah, Catholics do have the Eucharist. There are many Orthodox, for example, Seraphim Hamilton and many Orthodox priests that I personally know, they affirm that the Eucharist in the Catholic Church is a valid Eucharist. But let me get into that, that quote that Luigi said, that if you have the Eucharist, you have everything, right? Okay, so if you have the Eucharist, does that mean that you don't need baptism? If you have the Eucharist, does that mean that you don't need chrismation? If you have the Eucharist, does that mean that you don't need the priesthood? If you have the Eucharist, does that mean that you don't need the Bible? If you have the Eucharist, you have everything, which is the quote that he gave. Does that mean that you don't need any of those things? Because if you have the Eucharist just by itself, that's, that's all you need. So that quote is just very weak and it, it doesn't prove uh, the point that he was trying to prove. And then the next point that he made is, I think this is the final point in his opening statement. He was saying that the early church, the apostles themselves, worked off of a conciliar model. Now, it's true that they did have the conciliar model, but it's not true that the apostles exclusively worked off of the conciliar model. If you go to the book of Acts, you see where the first pope, uh, St. Peter the Apostle, where he himself was making doctrinal decrees and even disciplinary decrees all on his own without the consent of the church. For example, Peter the Apostle was the one that allowed the Gentiles to come into the church. And he did that all by himself, all on his own. And it wasn't until after the fact that he went back to the, uh, to the Jewish Christians and he said, yeah, I allowed Gentiles to come into the church. And he did that without a council. He did that all on his own. So if, uh, you know, Luigi or anyone Orthodox wants to argue that uh, the early church and the apostles themselves uh, exclusively used the conciliar model, um, the Bible disproves that. The Bible proves that Peter himself and even other apostles too were able to function in a definitive and universal way without needing a council. So um, these are all of the points. There's about 20 points that he made there in his opening statement. And that is the answer to all of his points. So what I just did here, uh, I gave you the response that I should have given um, during the debate because after he gave his uh, opening statement, like I said, I did my first rebuttal and it was just not good because I was all over the place. Um, so I just gave the rebuttal that I should have given in the debate. Um, so there you go. Now the next part of the debate was his rebuttal to me. So he brought up uh, Father Richard Price Coast in which he says that St. Leo's tome at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 was judged by the work of St. Cyril of Alexandria from the previous Council of Ephesus in 431. So the point that he's making is that how could the Pope be infallible if the Pope's writing was being judged according to St. Cyril of Alexandria? Well, St. Cyril of Alexandria himself tells us in his writings that the only reason that his teaching was, uh, was correct was because his teaching had been approved by Pope St. Celestine. Remember that St. Cyril of Alexandria appealed to Pope St. Celestine and he asked St. Celestine to be able to have an ecumenical council uh, in order to uh, judge uh, Nestorius as a heretic if he was found guilty of heresy. But in Cyril's letters corresponding with Pope Celestine, he says he appeals to St. Celestine's orthodoxy. They're corresponding about the issue of Nestorianism. And Pope Celestine was the one that gave the orthodox teaching that was upheld by the Council of Ephesus and St. Cyril of Alexandria, who uh, presided over the Council of Ephesus, um, all of his writings that he wrote, he wrote because he had permission from the Pope St. Celestine to write, and Saint, uh, Pope St. Celestine had confirmed the orthodox teaching to St. Cyril. So it doesn't work to say that, that Pope St. Leo was judged by St. Cyril of Alexandria because St. Cyril of Alexandria appealed to Pope Celestine. So that doesn't work either. Um, then he went on and he made a point about St. Clement of Rome because I made a point in my opening statement about Pope St. Clement of Rome in the first century and in the apostolic age uh, having authority even in the uh, territory of, of Corinth. The point that he brought up was Clement writing to Corinth versus Paul writing to Corinth. He said if uh, Pope St. Clement writing to Corinth proves uh, papal supremacy, then the Apostle Paul writing to Corinth should prove Pauline supremacy. 
Well, here's the difference, is that all of the apostles themselves actually had universal jurisdiction too, by virtue of the fact that they were apostles. And all of the apostles were infallible, and all of the apostles had universal jurisdiction as long as they were in communion with Peter. As long as the apostles were all in communion with the apostle St. Peter, they all had universal jurisdiction. They all were infallible when teaching on matters of uh, faith and morals because they were apostles. So appealing to, Saint, uh, to something that St. Paul did uh, doesn't work because St. Paul was an apostle. St. Clement wasn't an apostle. He was just the successor of one of the apostles. So that's the difference. He was trying to argue that Corinth was actually part of Roman ter territory anyway. Um, but Corinth is actually in the eastern part of the empire. And uh, he tried to uh, defend this claim by saying that uh, there were councils where there were legates from Corinth that represented uh, Rome at certain uh, councils. Well, that actually doesn't prove anything because there were multiple councils where the Roman legate was someone from the East. So, for example, in my opening statement, I actually mention examples where the Pope in Rome had uh, legates or he had uh, vicars that were in the East. For example, um, one of the Pope's vicars in the East, in Asia Minor, in Philadelphia, the Bishop of Philadelphia was the uh, legate, was the vicar for the Pope all the way in Rome. Which is interesting because if Constantinople was the second see uh, behind Rome, why was the Bishop of Philadelphia for a time, all the way in Asia Minor, why was he the legate or the vicar uh, to the Pope and not the Metropolitan or uh, not the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople? We also see that with uh, Stephen of Dor in the 7th century as well. Uh, a lot of the uh, Eastern uh, bishops were the vicars of the Popes in the first millennia. So that isn't something out of the ordinary. Uh, so his next point in his rebuttal was that St. Irenaeus says uh, that the church in Rome has its authority because of Peter and Paul. And then he says that Vatican I says only Peter. So he's saying, oh wait, St. Irenaeus says Peter and Paul, Vatican I says only Peter. That actually doesn't prove anything. That actually helps the papal claims because what he's saying is that St. Irenaeus is actually saying more than what Vatican I says. So what Vatican I says is all there in St. Irenaeus. St. Irenaeus just added another apostle who was Paul, which is true. Peter and Paul founded the church in Rome. Um, and Vatican I says that with Peter alone, that is enough to make ch uh, the church of Rome the head church of all the other churches. So pitting St. Irenaeus versus Vatican I, it doesn't help you at all. It just proves that what Vatican I said did exist in the time of St. Irenaeus in the second century. St. Irenaeus attests to Vatican I. St. Irenaeus just goes further. And then he also mentions St. Irenaeus exhorting Pope St. Victor and uh, how St. Irenaeus talked about how uh, uh, Pope St. Victor's uh, predecessor, St. Pope uh, uh, Anacletus, how he also conceded uh, about the issue of the uh, churches in Asia Minor celebrating uh, Easter on the 14th of Nisan every year instead of uh, on a Sunday with the rest of the church. And I explained to him in the debate that that issue actually doesn't matter because it, it proves that the Pope was still supreme. But in this case, he decided not to uh, exercise supremacy by forcing the church to change or by excommunicating the churches who were using the Jewish calendar, even though uh, Pope uh, St. Victor um, threatened them with excommunication and nobody said that he couldn't do it. Even St. Irenaeus didn't say that he didn't have the authority to excommunicate the churches in Asia Minor, he just, uh, St. Irenaeus did, is uh, he explained to the Pope why he shouldn't. And the Pope said, okay, you are correct, St. Irenaeus, I won't excommunicate them. So it doesn't mean that the Pope didn't have this authority, it just means that it wasn't exercised um, in the sense. It just means that uh, better prudence and better judgment prevailed, that's all it means. It doesn't mean that the Pope didn't have this authority. Um, and then he once again brought up the Council of Sardica, saying that the Council of Sardica uh, refutes uh, Vatican I, and he brought up uh, Canons 3 and 9, and again he made that assertion that the Pope was not allowed to uh, attend the, uh, the hearings of uh, you know, bishops and presbyters um, in the East. Uh, again, the Council of Sardica doesn't say that. Nowhere does the Council of Sardica say that the Pope isn't allowed to go to the East and hear uh, hearings himself. Uh, what the, the Council of Sardica just says is that the Pope can send legates that represent him 
to be able to uh, hear cases that are being appealed to Rome. So he's adding something to the Council of Sardica that just isn't there. Do you think that if the Pope decided that he was going to go personally to the East to, 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 to hear uh, the trials, um, do you think that anybody was going to stop him or protest or say, wait, why are you here? Why didn't you send, send legates? Why did you come here personally? The Council of Sardica doesn't say that the Pope couldn't do that. So that's something that, again, he's reading into the Council that's not there. Um, and then he says that there were synods in Alexandria and Rome that declared Nestorius a heretic prior to the Pope's uh, decree um, at the Council of Ephesus, right? Well, one of the synods that he mentioned was a synod in Rome. And who leads the synods in Rome? The Pope. So yeah, so the Pope had already uh, declared Nestorius a heretic um, before the Council of Ephesus did. And that Pope was again Pope St. Celestine. So Pope St. Celestine told St. Cyril of Alexandria, we have declared Nestorius to be a heretic. That's why St. Uh, Cyril of Alexandria was able to do the same thing at the Council of Ephesus in 431. So that point of regional synods already condemning uh, uh, Nestorius, uh, that doesn't mean anything, especially when one of those synods was a synod in Rome uh, held by the Pope. And then he brought up how St. Cyril's condemnation of Nestorius was circulated throughout the entire church. Again, it was circulated throughout the entire church because Pope St. Celestine approved of it and said, Yes, St. Uh, Cyril, uh, Nestorius is a heretic. This is the Orthodox faith. So that's why uh, his uh, writings were circulated through uh, the church. You could say that St. Cyril's writings against Nestorius, you could say that that's like a papal encyclical that wasn't written by the Pope, but that the Pope approved. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know that a lot of papal encyclicals actually aren't written by the Pope. They're written by somebody else, and the Pope just approves of it, and then that encyclical circulates throughout the entire church. So it was the same thing with St. Cyril's writings. St. Cyril's writings would qualify as being papal encyclicals. We know that St. Cyril wrote them, but because the Pope approved them, uh, they are magisterial, and that's why they circulated all throughout the church, because they had papal approval. He, uh, once again... Uh, brought up Father Richard Price that, uh, saying that uh, the emperor was called uh, the inviolable head. And when he brought it up here in his rebuttal, he actually, he like took the time, uh, Luigi did, he took the time to like stop and say, everybody please listen to what I'm about to say. So like this was like a really important point for him. And, you know, he, he, he like built it up only to say again that uh, the emperor was inviolable and that that means that, you know, Matthew 16 was referring to the emperor and that the emperor is infallible. But again, inviolable does not mean infallible. And according to Luigi, this is one of his most important points. But that point fails because inviolable doesn't mean what he said that it means in the debate. And then this was really interesting. He mentioned that Chalcedon had been accepted by all five patriarchs. And that's just not true. Chalcedon wasn't accepted by all five patriarchs. The patriarch of Alexandria rejected Chalcedon, and that uh, led to the Oriental Orthodox Schism. And that's going to actually going to come up later on in the cross-examination period. So I'll talk more about that when we get there. Uh, so the next point that he makes, he's, he asked the question, which pope was correct about Pope Honorius? And again, he asked that question trying to uh, disprove papal infallibility, which again, I could have said that isn't relevant to this debate, but I allowed it. Um, and I don't th even think that I got to answer this. Well, I did later on in the cross-examination period. I did answer it, but um, the Pope that defended Pope Honorius was correct because we know now that Pope Honorius did not hold to the heresy of monothelitism. Um, and then the last point that he made was um, that the Council of Trullo was accepted by Nicaea II. Um, and we actually get into that um, in the uh, cross-examination period. And... Um, this actually leads me to the next part of the debate, which was the cross-examination period. And this is another thing that I did wrong. This is another uh, uh, way in which I messed up. During the cross-examination period, um, so I already had a list of questions that were written out, you know, for him to ask him. Questions that were really good, really, really good questions. But before I got to those questions, I actually wanted to respond to uh, this rebuttal. So... During my cross-examination period, I started asking him a few questions about some of the points that he made in an attempt to kind of had, have another rebuttal period of my own. But this was a mistake because I would ask him questions, right? And I wasn't really listening to his responses. Um, again, just because it was my first time, I, mean, I don't know, I was nervous, I was jittery. I would ask him a quick question 
and then he would give a response and I, I wouldn't really listen to the response so I wouldn't ask him a relevant question based on the response that he just gave and I would just move on to the next question um, and then once again he'd give a response, I wouldn't really listen to it, I'd move on to the next question because I was just trying to get to the list of questions that I already had written out. Um, but I was just asking those initial questions first because I kind of wanted to respond to some of the claims that he made in his rebuttal. Um, but I think that was a mistake because he was responding to my questions and because I wasn't listening, I would just move on. And I think that made me look bad. I, you know, I would just move on to the next thing and it made it look like I didn't have a response to his response. So I probably should have just started out with the questions that I already had written out and I should have just let his rebuttal go because... I'm sure that, you know, because he actually ended up asking me a lot of questions based on the points that he brought up in his rebuttal during his cross-examination. So that was another amateur mistake on my part. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just gone into the questions that I already had written out. Uh, because once I did get to those questions that I had written out, that was when um, a lot of people uh, that watched the debate, they told me that the tide really turned and that a lot of people who think that I won the debate they say that I won it uh, during the cross-examination period. When I started asking him the questions that I already had written out beforehand, I started asking him those questions. He couldn't answer those questions. Um, and that was when people said, you got him. You got him right. You, you got him during the cross-exam. Once you started examining him, uh, that was when you won the debate, according to the people who think that I won the debate. Um, I, actually, one of my viewers, one of my followers, after the debate, he reached out to me. Uh, he's a lawyer. So he does this like for his job and he said, hey, take it from me. I'm a lawyer. I know how to judge debates. You won the debate. So for all that it's worth, and I'm not, I'm not saying whether I did or didn't, but one of my viewers who is a lawyer says, as a lawyer, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that you won the debate. So I was according to him. Most people who think that I won the debate say that I won it during uh, this cross-examination period. And if you actually go back and you watch... Um, uh, the uh, go back and you watch the debate if you put on the live chat uh, the chat that was going on live while we were doing the debate I went back and I actually was reading the live chat everyone in the live chat was saying that as well I would when I got to the questions that I already had written out beforehand for him and I started asking him those questions he couldn't answer those questions and that was when I started noticing that everyone in the live chat when I went back and I and I rewatched the debate the live chat where everyone was saying, oh, he's not answering the questions, he's not answering the questions, Alex got him, uh, Alex just won the debate. It seemed like that was the um, prevailing opinion from, uh, from the audience. Um, so I asked him the questions that I asked him, um, and he gave certain responses. So really quick, let me go back to the freestyle questions that I had for him that I shouldn't have asked him, but I asked him anyway because I wanted to respond to his rebuttal. I, uh, he brought up the Council of Trullo. That was the last point that he, that he brought up in his rebuttal, that it was accepted by Nicaea II. And I brought up, uh, in my cross-examination, I brought up that Pope Constantine in the year 711, he was the one that actually affirmed, uh, ratified the, the Council of Trullo, but he didn't ratify it as an ecumenical council. He ratified it as a council that was binding only to the East, and he said that those canons didn't um, uh, apply to the West. And also, before Pope Constantine accepted the Council of Trullo, uh, the Roman Emperor himself, uh, he kept sending the Council of Trullo to uh, multiple popes until one of them would ratify him. And he sent them to one pope who rejected the Council of Trullo, he sent them to another pope, who was Pope John VII, who didn't say anything about the Council of Trullo. And then he finally sent it to Pope Constantine. And uh, Constantine, Pope Constantine, was the one that finally ratified him with certain qualifications, which were, again, that uh, the Council of Trullo was only for the East, not binding on the West. So that right there actually shows that the pope is above, council, uh, above canons, because the Roman emperor himself kept sending canons to the Pope until one of them would, re would, uh, would accept them, which finally happened with uh, Constantine before Nicaea II and Pope Hadrian. There were questions that I asked him that I could have asked in better ways the way what I should have asked him during this time. I should have asked him, why did the Emperor keep asking different Popes to ratify Council of Trullo if uh, Popes are not above councils? That's what I should have asked him, but I didn't because I'm a beginner still. But anyway... And the next thing that I brought up in the cross-examination was about patriarchs rejecting the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon. Um, he denied this. This was actually very interesting. This is just not true, by the way, what he, what he said here. 
Um, I brought up how um, Ephesus was uh, denied by the Patriarch of Antioch. Chalcedon was denied by the Patriarch of Alexandria. He denied this and he said, no, actually, the true Patriarchs eventually did accept uh, these councils and that's why they were made ecumenical. This just isn't true. Ephesus and Chalcedon were both immediately ratified by the Pope as being ecumenical, even though not all of the Patriarchs agreed on them. And he said, what he said was that eventually there were Greek patriarchs that did agree with the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon, but these Greek patriarchates um, were not founded until the 6th century. Um, in Ephesus, um, the Greek patriarch of, uh, of Antioch, I'm sorry, um, the first Greek patriarch that uh, Antioch had was in um, the year 518, and the first Greek patriarch that... Uh, Alexandria had was in the year 536, long after the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon. So it's just not true that all patriarchs ratified these councils and then they became ecumenical. They were ecumenical long before uh, the Greeks had a patriarch in Antioch and uh, Alexandria. So that point just isn't true. And I should have brought that up, but I didn't. Um, the, next, the next thing that I asked him was about Caesarot Papism and uh, the Arian Emperor. So, because again, it seemed like he was trying to defend Caesar of Papism. So I asked him, I said, um, what about in the 4th century when the emperors were Arian heretics? And he brought up something that was, again, not true. He brought up that Pope Felix II was an Arian. Here's the thing. Pope Felix II wasn't an Arian. And the reason Pope Felix II wasn't an Arian is because there's no such person as Pope Felix II. That's right. There is no Pope Felix II. But Luigi claimed that Pope Felix II taught Arianism. There is no Pope Felix II. What we do have is an anti-pope named Felix II. Anti-popes are not popes. Anti-popes are uh, people who claim to be the Pope, but are not the Pope. So no, Pope Felix II didn't teach um, Arianism, because we never had a Pope Felix II. We had an anti-Pope who was an Arian, but he was never the Pope. Anti-Popes are not Popes. That's what I should have said um, in this cross-exam, but instead I was like, what did I, I was like, oh, did Pope Felix II teach Arianism in his magisterium? That was dumb, because I conceded to him that Pope Felix II was an Arian, when, again, we've never had a Pope Felix II, so that was dumb on my part. I should have known that, but again, nervousness, you know, wet behind the ears, whatever. I, I failed on that point, but that's true. We've never had a Pope Felix II. <clears throat> the next thing I did was, um, I asked him about uh, the Pope being the first among equals and about Constantinople making uh, churches uh, autocephalous, um, According to Eastern Orthodoxy, you would need a canonical process to make churches autocephalous. And uh, you don't have that because you can't uh, call councils, and that's what caused the schism between Constantinople and Russia. They schismed over Ukraine being uh, made uh, autocephalous by the Patriarch of Constantinople. Russia had a problem with that, so the Patriarch of uh, Moscow excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople. And then I finally got to the good questions, and uh, that's when I started asking him the questions that I already had written out. And those questions uh, started with, um, with me pointing out the universal jurisdiction uh, with uh, Pope uh, Martin. And he didn't have a good answer to that. Then I brought up uh, Sardica and the Pope's uh, decisions being final with uh, Pope Martin. The Pope Martin was the one that in the, late seven, in the middle of the 7th century, he went in to the uh, Patriarchate of Jerusalem and he completely gutted it and he appointed a uh, new uh, clergy in the entire Patriarchate of Jerusalem. And he, he didn't have an answer for that because he said that he just wasn't, uh, he wasn't aware about that, uh, uh, that uh, event in history. Um, so then we moved on to the next question, and I brought up Sardica and the Pope's decisions being final and not being able to be overturned. Um, so I brought up, I actually read some of the councils from Sardica, and he, he didn't have a good, um, uh, a good response to it. Um, he brought up the Miletian Schism of the uh, 4th century, and he said that Rome was, the, was on the wrong side of this, and that it was the only church that was out of communion from the universal church, because uh, Rome 
uh, recognized the wrong patriarch of Antioch, but this actually just isn't true because Alexandria, right, the uh, patriarch of Alexandria didn't recognize St. Flavian as a patriarch of Antioch either. Um, uh, the patriarch of Alexandria supported Paulinus as the patriarch as well. So when he said that Rome was the only church that was on the wrong side of this issue, that's not true. Um, Alexandria and Rome uh, were actually in agreement. Um, so that doesn't work either. Uh, eventually, Rome allowed St. Flavian to be uh, the uh, patriarch of, uh, of Antioch, but that only stood because Rome allowed it. So it's not true that Rome was on the wrong side of, of, uh, of the issue. Rome decided the issue. Rome decided that St. Flavian could stay as the patriarch of uh, Antioch, uh, and the, the patriarch of Alexandria was going for the other guy who was Paulinus. So the way that he uh, represented that uh, episode in history was just factually incorrect as well. When I brought up uh, Pope St. Martin, who uh, replaced two patriarchates, um, and he deflected by uh, uh, going to Lateran, uh, the Synod of the Lateran in 649, and uh, he didn't answer the question where I, that I posed to him, which was about St. Martin deposing two entire patriarchates and replacing it, replacing them. Um, he didn't want to answer this. Instead, he deflected to uh, the uh, Synod of the Lateran in 649, and 649 uh, not being ecumenical. But I pressed him on it, and this right here was a really important part of the debate. In fact, I would say that this might be the most important part of the debate. And I didn't even realize this. I, I didn't realize this when it happened because, again, um, like it was two and a, it was almost three hours, whatever it was, and it went by so fast that I like don't remember any of it. Even while it was happening, like I wasn't registering what he was saying to me. It wasn't until after the fact that multiple people reached out to me uh, when I asked them this particular question. I didn't realize this, which shows how much of an amateur I am. I should have realized this, and I should have called them out when it happened. So many people reached out to me to tell me this, and actually I saw it in the live chat as well. When this particular moment in the debate happened, um, everyone in the live chat uh, called it out, pointed it out. Luigi actually conceded the debate thesis. When I asked him about Pope St. Martin, um, he conceded it, and he said that, you know, he said, because I pressed him on it, he was trying to deflect to Lateran 649, but I pressed him on it, and he said, okay, uh, Pope St. Martin being able to depose entire patriarchates and replace them, that's part of, uh, of uh, being the first C. So then I said, okay, so the first C is able to do this, and he said yes. So when he said yes, he actually conceded the thesis of the debate, which is, again, papal supremacy, defined by Vatican I, existed in the first millennium. And papal supremacy is about a papal uh, immediate universal jurisdiction. He conceded it because he said the first C had universal jurisdiction. So he actually conceded it. I didn't realize it when it happened, but everyone watching realized it because it was in the chat. And then multiple people reached out to me afterwards and saying, they actually congratulated me. They said, hey, congratulations. I don't think you realized this while you were, you know, uh, in the middle of it, but he conceded the debate thesis to you during the cross-examination. So this was a huge part um, of the debate because what it means is that on a technicality, I won because he conceded the debate thesis. So I'm not saying that I won the debate because I'm such a good debater and that I had a great performance. I'm just saying that if it's judged that I won, I won off of a technicality. And I don't even think maybe he didn't realize it either. But again, he deflected on this because he was saying, oh wait, Lateran 649, that wasn't ecumenical. He was trying to bring that up. Um, but what I should have done, and I didn't do this, but I should have done this, is I should have brought up Pope St. Martin's predecessor. Um, his predecessor was uh, Pope Theodore, uh, because Pope Theodore did the exact same thing in Jerusalem, and uh, he was able to do it before the Synod of Lateran 649. He did it without a synod, so I should have brought that up. Um, because that right there, he would have had nowhere to, uh, he wouldn't have been able to appear, uh, appeal the Lateran 649. I should have brought up Pope Theodore doing this. With that right there, it, it would have been over. But according to a lot of people that watched it, it was over anyway because he actually conceded. And he actually, real, he actually did realize, it says here in my notes that uh, when I watched it back, he actually did realize that he conceded um, because he tried to save himself by saying that that's not all Vatican I teaches. He's saying, oh, Vatican I also teaches that the Pope has to be infallible and all of these things, but the debate was only about uh, supremacy, immediate universal jurisdiction. 
So I don't have, I didn't have to prove papal infallibility in the debate, even though I think I did prove it, um, and he unknowingly proved it as well. Um, I didn't have to prove it in order to prove the, the thesis of the debate. Um, and I've seen a lot of Orthodox do this. Uh, I think, you know, like Jay Dyer is like a really famous example of someone that does this when he debates. He expects, um, you know, you could be debating something like, like this debate thesis and he will like try and force his opponent to prove everything that Vatican I teaches about the papacy all together at the same time, which is ridiculous. You don't have to prove everything all together at the same time. You can do it piece by piece. You can have one debate about jurisdiction. You can have another debate about infallibility. You can have another debate about the Pope actually being the successor of St. Peter the Apostle. Um, you don't have to prove everything that Vatican I teaches in one debate. You can do it, you know, piece by piece. So he tried to do that. He tried to go the J. Dyer route and say, wait, Vatican I also teaches all of these things. And, you know, I should have said, it uh, doesn't matter. You just conceded the debate. You just said that the first C had ordinary universal jurisdiction. So he conceded it. But anyway, you live and you learn, right? Another great question that I asked him was, uh, I asked him if he could cite any canons that say that uh, Rome's decrees could be overruled or uh, appealed. And he brought, up, um, he brought up 9 and 17 of Constantinople 1, but I think he misspoke because Constantinople 1 doesn't have a canon 9 or a, can or a canon 17. Uh, Constantinople 1 only has four canons. So I think he misspoke, and he was probably referring to another council. Um, so Luigi, if you watch this, uh, um, if you clarify to me, shoot me a text, call me, tell me what canons you were referring to, because Constantinople 1 doesn't have a canon 9 or a canon 17. Um, and I think he misspoke because he, then he mentioned canon 3 of Constantinople. So he went from 9 to 17 to 3. He didn't go in order, so that leads me to believe that 9 and 17 belong to another uh, council before Constantinople. But he brought up canon 3 of Constantinople, um, and he brought up uh, canon 28 of Chalcedon. But here's the problem. Well, first of all, when he brought up Canon 3 of Constantinople and Canon 3 of Chalcedon, um, I went in to explain to him how those uh, canons were not accepted by the West. What I should have done, again, correcting my mistakes, I should have just told them that Canon 3 of Constantinople 1 and Canon 28 of Chalcedon don't say what I asked for. I asked for canons that say that uh, Rome's decrees could be overturned. Canon 3 of Constantinople 1, Canon 28 of Chalcedon don't say that. What those canons say is that the, the uh, Church of Constantinople is second place to Rome. That's all they say. They say nothing about Constantinople being to overturn Rome's decrees. I asked for canons that would say that, and he was not able to provide any of them. So he can't provide canons to prove his position. So I did ask him if he knew that these canons that he cited were rejected. He brought up the Prisca Versio. For those of you who don't know... The Prisca Versio is a collection of canons um, that was compiled like in the 6th century. He claimed that these canons were accepted by the Universal Church because uh, they are found in the collection of the Prisca Versio, but there's actually multiple problems with this. So the Prisca Versio, first of all, is a collection of canons that is actually based off of a prior collection of canons from Dionysius uh, Exegesis. So Dionysius Exegesis was a uh, canonist right, I think in the uh, 5th century, and uh, he had compiled canons. Canon 28 is not in his uh, canon uh, compilation. Canon 28 of Chalcedon was actually added later on in uh, the Prisca Versio, and it's actually not even cited as Canon 28 of Chalcedon, it's cited as Canon 3 of Constantinople 1. Um, so there's a problem with that already, but here's a, a, the bigger problem is that these um, canon lists, these, these, these compilations of canons, um, they are just for the matter of, they are just for a historical record. Uh, they are, collect, they are uh, compiling the canons, but it doesn't mean that all of the canons in these compilations are still applied. Because, you know, I don't know if Luigi would concede this, but it's just a matter of fact. There are canons that apply at one point in church history that no longer apply at another point in church history. I didn't get to bring this up during the debate. I wish that I had brought this up, but because I would have loved to see how, how, how Luigi would have responded to it. I would have brought up Canon 101 of Trullo, because he says that Trullo was completely accepted at the Council of Nicaea II, and that all of the canons were read out loud and accepted, 
Well, Canon 101 of the Synod of Trullo mandates communion in the hand. Canon 101 mandates communion in the hand for the Eastern churches. I would have loved to have brought this up. I would have loved to have seen him, uh, heard his response to it, because I'm sure as he's well aware, there are no Eastern churches to this day that practice communion in the hand. Not a single one. Ironically, the only church that does do communion in the hand is the Catholic Church in the Latin Rite, right? So the Catholic Church is actually more faithful to Canon 101 of Trullo than even the Eastern churches when the canons of Trullo don't even apply to the West. Um, but I would have loved to have, to have brought that up to see how he would have uh, responded to it. That right there, that alone is an example of a canon, an Eastern canon, that is ignored. It no longer applies. It, it, uh, no one follows it anymore. So just because these canons are collected um, doesn't mean that these canons apply. So he brought it up. He brought up a connection, uh, uh, a canon collection that's based off of a previous canon collection that did not include canon 28 of Chalcedon or canon 3 of Constantinople. They were added later on. Doesn't mean that they were authoritative, that they were being observed by the churches, like how canon 101 of Trullo isn't observed by the Eastern churches today. And then here's another thing. He concedes, he conceded, you know, after, after, I, after he brought this up, he conceded that there were popes that rejected some canons while other popes accept, accepted them. He conceded it, that also kind of concedes the thesis of the debate that the pope has universal jurisdiction at least over canons. He conceded this point. Um, again, he, 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 he said that it was dangerous. He said it's very dangerous that uh, Pope Leo um, tried to reject canon 28 of Chalcedon uh, but, but it's just true. He did reject Canon 28 of Chalcedon, and uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople bowed to Pope St. Leo's authority, and the churches, again, they didn't uh, hold the Canon 28 of Chalcedon. It wasn't until 100 years later, that, and I brought this up too, uh, Canon 28 of Chalcedon was inserted into the civil Roman law. It wasn't part of the ecclesial law. Um, and then uh, I asked him why uh, the Eastern Orthodox have not been able to hold a single council since the schism, and uh, he brings up the Pan-Orthodox Council of 1672. He says they're just not called ecumenical, but that they are, for all intents and purposes, uh, ecumenical. But the problem is that Russia doesn't accept the Orthodox Council of 1672. And actually, not all uh, Orthodox uh, hold to it today. But at the moment while it was happening, Russia rejected it. And then later on, after it happened, a lot of Orthodox rejected it as well. Um, so he didn't provide a good answer to that question. Um, and then I asked him if uh, Canon 28 of Chalcedon is divine revelation, and that was the last question that I asked him, and he said that, um, he said that it was, which is a crazy, crazy statement to make, because what he is saying is that God revealed through Jesus Christ to the apostles that the church of Constantinople was second place to the church of Rome. That's the question that I asked him, and his response, that's what... Saying yes to that question means that that's what you believe. It's not. Canon 28 of Chalcedon isn't part of divine revelation. He said that it was. So that was uh, a terrible moment on, on his part. But that was the end of my cross-examination. I think that it started off really shaky. Um, but when I started, once I started asking the questions that I actually had written out beforehand, that is when it, that's when it got really good. And that's when a lot of people in the live chat and even after the fact told me that they believed that I won the debate because... Um, he conceded. He conceded twice uh, in, in my cross-examination period. Uh, but then after that, uh, we get to his cross-examination period. Um, and these are the questions that he asked me. He, uh, first of all, he, actually, he asked me about Apostolic Canon 34. This was a huge blunder on actually both of our ends, but more on my end because I should have caught this. And I did it because, again, I'm a newbie, right? He quotes Canon 34, right? But he misquotes it. He actually quoted it correctly at the beginning of his opening statement, but then he actually misquotes it here when he, he asked me a question about it. He says that Canon 34 um, says that the first C cannot do anything without the consent of the church. Now, I should have caught that he misquoted Canon 34, but I didn't catch it. So I, was, I gave really dumb, a really dumb answer to this question, and I looked really bad um, in answering this first question. What I should have said is I should have called out that he misquoted it. Canon 34 doesn't say 
that the first C can't do anything uh, without the consent of the church. Um, Canon 34 actually says what it, you know, he said at the, the beginning of his opening statement. Canon 34 is referring to the patriarchs, the heads of national churches, shouldn't do anything apart from the rest of the church. And as I already mentioned earlier, uh, the Pope functions in multiple capacities. He can also function, uh, function as a patriarch. What that means is that Canon 34 would apply to the Bishop of Rome, it would apply to the Pope, but it wouldn't apply to his universal prerogatives. It would only apply to his prerogatives as a patriarch. So that's what I should have said, but I didn't say that, so I messed up. But he also brought up uh, Lateran 649 not being accepted as ecumenical. And um, Lateran 649 itself as a council wasn't accepted as ecumenical because the uh, emperor um, uh, didn't want it to be ecumenical. And again, the term ecumenical uh, means that it's imperial. What that means is that the imperial head, the emperor, uh, didn't want the Lateran uh, Council of 649 to be part of the uh, imperial law. Um, so that's what ecumenical means, but again, um, Lateran 649, what it was taught there, was actually uh, definitive, and then it was reaffirmed by um, Constantinople III. So uh, whether Lateran 649 is ecumenical or not is actually uh, irrelevant, uh, because you're limiting it based on what the civil authority says, when what's really important is what it teaches, and if the ecclesial uh, authority of the church as a whole universally accepted it, which it did. Then he asked me why Pope uh, Anacletus conceded to St. Polycarp. I thought I gave a good response to that. Um, and then he uh, brought up papal forgeries that were used in councils. Now, here's something that he probably doesn't know. A lot of people don't realize that even the first seven ecumenical councils, including Ephesus, including Chalcedon, uh, Constantinople II, III, and Nicaea II, they all used forged documents. A lot of people don't know this, but it's true. And I actually think that I'm going to do an episode. I want to do an episode where I go over all of the spurious documents that are used by the seven ecumenical councils because almost all of them uh, use them. I think even Nicaea used spurious documents as well. For example, there were certain documents that were used in ecumenical councils that were wrongfully attributed to saints, but they were actually written by heretics and even heresiarchs. So there were heretical works that were attributed to saints, and because they thought that they came from uh, the saint, they accepted them. Um, so I think I'm going to do a whole uh, uh, video where I talk about the forgeries used in ecumenical councils, um, because he tried to bring that up as if that did damage to the papal claims, but it doesn't. If he's being consistent, that does damage to orthodoxy as well. But with the Catholic position, it actually doesn't do damage uh, to the church at all. But uh, the Catholic position is the only position that can... Um, uh, account for forgeries being used in ecumenical councils because it also seemed to me like Luigi might actually take the position of um, ecumenical fundamentalism. Ecumenical fundal fundamentalism means that um, ecumenical councils are correct in every single thing that they teach, but if that is his position, it would actually be a contradiction because he's already admitted that the Council of Chalcedon taught the three chapters. The three chapters are in the Council of Chalcedon, so he's already proved that uh, councils can use heretical documents, right? Because the Council of Constantinople II um, condemned them as heresy. That means that he has to, he has to, just if he's being logical and consistent, he has to concede that ecumenical councils can indeed present heretical documents uh, and present them forward, even as being orthodox. Um, so he asked that. Oh, and then he brought up that Nestorius rejected the term Theotokos. It's actually not true. We know that Nestorius, even before the Council of Ephesus, um, had a homilies in which he called Mary Theotokos. A lot of people don't know this. Nestorius called Mary Theotokos in homilies before the Council of Ephesus. And that's what John, the Patriarch of Antioch, John of Antioch brought that up, and that's why John of Antioch was defending Nestorius. He was saying, here you go. Nestorius has called Mary Theotokos before in, um, um, in his homily. So no, Nestorius isn't a, a, a Nestorian, right? So he brought that up, and it's, it's wrong. It's not true. Um, he brought up the donation of Constantine. And again, I didn't say this um, in, the, in his, in his cross-examination of me. I should have said this, but I didn't. I was trying to defend the, I was defending the, the donation of Constantine, which I think I did a good job of defending, but I left out a really important point. 
the donation of Constantine, the reason that it was so significant and the reason it was used by popes is because the donation of Constantine is what the popes used in order to get the papal states. Because the, the, the donation of Constantine doesn't just say that the pope is the infallible head of the universal church. Um, the donation of Constantine also says that the bishop of Rome is the head of even the provinces of all the Roman Empire. The donation of Constantine says that the pope is equal to the emperor even in civil matters. And that's why the donation of Constantine was used. Um, it wasn't used merely uh, to uh, prove papal infallibility or papal supremacy. It was also used to prove something else, which is civil papal authority. That's why that document, which is a forgery, was so important. And then he brings up Pope Vigilius and his three documents. Um, and I already explained that earlier, but he said something that's just factually not true. Uh, in this part of the debate, in his cross-examination of me, he was saying that Pope Vigilius and, the, and uh, Constantinople II and Emperor Justinian, that the contention was about whether the three authors of the three chapters were saints or not. That just isn't true. Um, Pope Vigilius fighting with Ro the Roman Emperor Justinian had nothing to do with whether these three authors of the three chapters were saints. That, that's not true at all. It was about the orthodoxy or the heterodoxy of their writings. There's nothing in Pope Vigilius' writings that talks about, in which he's arguing uh, that these three men should be saints or not. Um, so I don't know why he said that. That's just factually untrue. And then he brought up uh, Pope Honorius. Um, he said, is Pope Honorius a heretic or is Pope St. Agatho uh, wrong? And I should have brought up that Pope St. Agatho was the one that said that all of his predecessors were free from error, which would have included Honorius. I should have brought that up. I didn't bring that up. Um, but again, I've already mentioned how, uh, you know, any pope that would have condemned, anybody that would have condemned Pope Honorius as a heretic would have been wrong because we already know that he didn't hold to that heresy. Um, so that was his, cro his cross-examination of me. I think I did okay in answering his questions, but I definitely think I could have done a lot better. Um, and a lot of people pointed out how when he was cross-examining me, um, that Luigi was actually getting visibly like upset. He was getting flustered at my answers. Um, so a lot of people thought that I, during the cross-examination portion of the debate, both when I examined him and he examined me, that I walked away uh, with the win, at least in that part of the debate, uh, just because, because of that, because he conceded to me when I examined him, and he was looking really fl flustered when he was examining me. So um, I think I did okay. I think I could have done a lot better. Um, I wish that I would have given the answers that I just gave here, but it is what it is. And then um, we, after that, we moved into uh, audience Q&A, so uh, the people that were watching the debate live were able to ask us questions, and there's a, a few really important uh, things that happened during this Q&A that I need to bring up. Something that, again, I heard it, I even registered it when he said it, but for some reason I, I, I didn't realize how big of a deal it was. It was the very first question of the Q&A. Um, they were talking about reunification between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, and Luigi actually said that reunification would be possible and that the Orthodox, that he, that the Orthodox Church could affirm the filioque. He said the, the filioque, for a reunification to happen, the filioque should be affirmed, just not part of the creed. That's exactly the Eastern Catholic position. That's my position. Luigi, who, wants to, who is an Orthodox inquirer, he's going to become Greek Antiochian Orthodox. He says that he affirms the filioque, that the filioque can be affirmed uh, in the theology as the doctrine, just not be in the creed. That is crazy. So um, I've been, uh, I've visited Greek uh, Antiochian churches before. There's one in particular that I've gone to where they actually have on the bulletin board um, in the hall, um, just outside of the church, they have on a bulletin board, they have, they have like a list of heresies, of the most ancient heresies. And filioquism is one of the heresies. And, and I know that the, that the Greek Antiochian church, they are super dogmatic about the filioque being a heresy. I know that there are other uh, orthodox that they don't think it's a heresy, don't, they don't think the filioque is a big deal, but I don't know that the Antiochians think it's a huge deal. So I, I just find it interesting that he wants to join the Antiochian church. If he does, I'm sure that they're going to tell him that he has to uh, repudiate the filioque because according to how he answered this question, apparently he believes it. So that was very, very telling and it was so surprising and uh, it never came up again. So that was crazy. 
I gave my closing and then he gave his closing and he talked about um, how the Fifth Ecumenical Council taught that it was over a pope. Again, that's just not true. The Fifth Ecumenical Council, uh, I even said it in my opening statement, I give quotes about how the Fifth Ecumenical Council actually acknowledges Pope Vigilius' uh, authority, um, his universal authority. Um, he said that Nicaea II, oh, he said that Nicaea II uh, said that the Fifth Council, the Council of Constantinople II, was ratified by just four patriarchs. Luigi, you're going to have to send me a quote because I cannot find that anywhere in Nicaea II. I don't find anywhere where Nicaea II says that Constantinople II was ratified by the four patriarchs. We know that Pope Vigilius ratified it as well, so I don't know why he would say that. Nicaea II, as far as I understand, from what I've read, doesn't say that at all. So, uh, Luigi, if you're watching this, man, send me that quote. Nicaea II doesn't say that, as far as I know. And uh, then he says that... Um, so he brings up the forgeries in Second Millennium Catholic Councils, but again, it seems like he isn't aware of all of the forgeries that were used in the first seven ecumenical councils. So again, I want to do an episode uh, where I bring all that up. I'd love to see how he responds and also how other Orthodox who are uh, ecumenical fundamentalists, um, how they would respond, uh, conciliar fundamentalists. I want to know how they would respond to forgeries being used by ecumenical councils that they accept. He actually concedes again that there were uh, legit writings that did make the papal claims. So he conceded the thesis of the debate again at the end, at the end of the debate when he gave his closing statement. So there were two, maybe three times in this debate where he conceded the thesis of it, which means that he lost just on a technicality. And he actually even says that these papal claims were made by Leo, Agatho, and Celestine. So he conceded. And then he, uh, he says that the schism was caused by forgeries. That's actually not true. The schism was not caused by forgeries. Go and read about why the schism happened. It had very little to do with forgeries because, first of all, there were forgeries being used on both sides in the West and in the East. So uh, that was how he uh, concluded the debate. Overall, I thought the debate was fantastic. I think he did a great job. I think he came off really well in the debate. He, he, he came off like a, an experienced seasoned debater. I did not. I came off super rusty. Um, but again, when you actually just look at the points that were made, um, now here in this debrief, I was able to respond to a lot of those points. And a lot of those points uh, either just missed the mark or, or were just completely inaccurate and wrong. Um, and ultimately, I don't, they don't disprove uh, the papal claims of Vatican I. And I think that uh, the presentation that I gave in the debate uh, was strong because he actually wasn't able to disprove any of the particular uh, examples that I give. Instead, he brought up other things that don't disprove him either. So ultimately, with all things being said and done, I do believe that the Catholic position was a stronger position in this debate. However, when it came to just performances, not Catholic versus Orthodox, Alex versus Luigi. Um, I think that Alex was super rusty, and I think that Luigi, for the most part, I think that he did an excellent job. So I know that this was a super long debrief. I hope that you guys enjoyed it, and I, I'm sure that you guys are all done with your coffee, water, soda, Hennessy. Um, but I hope that you guys enjoyed the debrief. And Luigi, if you see this, my friend, I really would love for you to make a response to this video um, because I've responded to every single point that you made in the debate. I believe that the points that you brought up do not disprove the Vatican One Papal teaching. You conceded the debate two or three times um, in your presentations, uh, in the cross exam and in the closing statement. And um, I would love to do it again. Luigi, you are always invited to be a guest here on this channel. And I hope that we get to do it again sometime soon. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this debrief. I know that it was a long one, but... The debate was long. Luigi brought up a lot of really great points. And um, who won the debate? You decide. But now after seeing this debrief, what do you think? Um, has your opinion on who won the debate changed? Uh, let me know in the comments down below. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. You are listening to The Voice of Reason. Glory to Jesus Christ. See you next time.